Hello and welcome to Represent NYC on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. My name is Victoria Burt and I am the producer of this show. New York City Council Member Mark Levine represents the seven districts of Northern Manhattan, which includes West Harlem, Morningside Heights, Washington Heights, and parts of the Upper West Side. He also serves as the chair of the Council Committee on Health and is a member of the Progressive Caucus. He is a leader on many issues, including housing, education, economic justice, transportation, environmentalism, and more. He's joining us here today to talk about, among other things, the reopening of New York City this fall. Welcome, how are you today? I'm doing fine, healthy, thank goodness, and that's the most important thing during this difficult time. Yeah, I, um, I want to talk to you about the fall and all the things that are sort of kicking back into gear here in New York City. Schools will be reopening and um, more in-person learning as opposed to remote, remote learning. Restaurants are opening for indoor dining um, on Wednesday. Talk to me about your thoughts on this, your concerns, and what we should expect. Well, first, the good news. It's been now a good 12, 14 weeks where we've been stable in New York City, even when other parts of the country had major rebounds in the number of cases. Um, we've been consistently at about 250 to 300 cases a day, newly diagnosed in the five boroughs. So the virus has still very much been here. It's still circulating. But uh, thanks to New Yorkers who have largely been wearing masks, it's not perfect, but largely people are doing that. Um, and we've been living our life outside. Uh, I mean, everything's happening outdoors over the summer, from dining to exercising to family reunions to weddings, birthday parties. We're, we're, we're doing everything outside, and that's been key to reducing risk. We've also been really slow and measured in our pace of reopenings. When other parts of the country, even starting in May, were going full-blown reopening, and they paid a price. And New York has been much more cautious. So for all those reasons, we've had a much more stable three or four months. Uh, inequality has persisted. I, I want to point that out, that it's, it's defined this virus from the beginning, and it still does. Um, in zip codes in Manhattan, which are wealthier, the positivity rate is one half of 1% in general, uh, including in recent weeks. But in, in black and brown neighborhoods, particularly uptown, for example, in my district in West Harlem, zip code 10031, the positivity rate is one and a half percent, so triple what it is in other parts of the borough. Um, still much lower than other places in the country and nowhere near what it was in the horrible days of the spring. But, um, but th there is a threat out there. And I'm sure we'll talk about what comes next, but. I think we are entering into a more uncertain, potentially riskier stage for this virus in New York City. So starting Wednesday, New Yorkers will be able to eat inside for the first time in a very, very long time. And we were one of the, we have one of the last places in New York to, to allow that. So talk to me about that process and your concerns about it and, and what we should expect. Well, after a very, very cautious several months on the reopening front in New York, this week, a lot is hitting uh, all at once. We have elementary school reopening for in-person class beginning on Tuesday. On Wednesday, we have reopening for limited seating, indoor dining, which I'll speak more about. Uh, also on Wednesday, we have um, limited reopening of indoor pools, places like recreation centers and WISE for one third of capacity. And then on Thursday, we had the reopening of middle and high schools, all happening within a matter of days. That's not ideally how you would plan it. Really, ideally, you'd have an opening step and then a 14-day pause. You can watch the numbers, see if we have a rebound. Things are good. You go to the next one, and you do it more deliberately. Uh, it all landed in the same week, which is not ideal. Um, and, the, and, and the reason why that wouldn't be good is because if, if we do have a, a, a little outbreak, we won't know which thing. Exactly. Is right. You know, if we saw that, uh, for example, reopening restaurants, uh, we could kind of isolate that as something which led to a rebound, then we could deal with that. But um, any rebounds we see in the coming weeks, is that going to be because of schools? Is it going to be because of restaurants? Uh, 
mean, pools is a smaller factor, but that's in there too. Uh, it's just going to be harder to tell. You know, restaurants, I, I, I do support this move, though with caution. We really have understood that indoor settings are much riskier. And there have been other parts of the country, certainly with 50% capacity in restaurants that have seen um, some super spreader events in restaurants. So we have to be really cautious there. There are a lot of protections built in, uh, particularly in terms of uh, ventilation and, and air quality uh, and, and temperature checks and other measures to, to hopefully reduce risk in restaurants. But this is also an economic lifeline for these small businesses, which are, are threatened potentially with extinction. Outdoor dining has been a huge success, but it's, it's not enough for most restaurants nor is 20 for 25% indoor dining, but it's just, we hope that together with outdoor dining and takeout, it would extend their, you know, extend, get, extend them something of a lifeline. And then if this works, we can go to 50% and, and potentially beyond, but we have to be really cautious here because of the impact indoor dining's had in other cities. So it's balancing our desire to move forward because of the economic stakes, but also continuing to watch the public health data to watch the positivity rate, to watch the number of new cases, and be ready that if that starts moving in a bad direction, we might have to reverse some of these reopenings. I understand that the open, um, the outdoor seating area is gonna be ending in October, right? Is that? That's the current plan. That would be a big mistake, in my opinion. Okay. We need to keep outdoor dining going as long as possible. I would say through the season, year round. And this is done in other parts of the world which have climates like New York, even, even colder. They have outdoor heating uh, through electric or propane heaters and uh, they serve lots of mulled wine and other hot drinks. Uh, I think New Yorkers are up for this. They have embraced outdoor dining in a huge way, including when the weather hasn't been great. It used to be if a few drops fa fall, everyone scatters from the outdoor dining. Now people just keep going. I think because they're enjoying it and because they understand it's safer, safer than being indoors. So let's give restaurant owners the option if they want it to go through the winter and use, use outdoor heating to extend it, uh, the time when it's comfortable by a month or two on either end. And as long as the restaurants are up for it and customers are willing to come, let's let it happen. It's much safer than indoor. So we're pushing very hard in the city council. In fact, there's some legislation which is just introduced by my colleagues in the council, one Manhattanite, Keith, Cower Keith Powers, and uh, our Brooklyn colleague, Antonio Reynoso, which would actually make outdoor dining year round. We need some other bills to make it permissible to have propane heaters on the sidewalks, because that's not currently allowed and gotta work out the safety issues there. But let's do this, I think permanently, but certainly in the midst of a pandemic, we gotta have people outside uh, year round, really. Yeah, and you've also um, recently codified a commercial lease assistance program, right? Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Because that would help with yes. businesses as well. Uh, this is, this, uh, thank you for asking. This is, I mean, our businesses are suffering. Restaurants, we've talked about, but there's no small business in New York City right now, which isn't struggling. And many of them are in battles with their landlords who are trying to evict them, who are refusing to be flexible on the rent. And often they can't afford an attorney and pretty much every landlord has an attorney often very high priced attorneys. So we want to level the print playing field for small businesses by uh, expanding and strengthening a city program to provide them with free attorneys. For example, if they're hauled into court on an eviction proceeding, if they are trying to renegotiate their lease for a lower rent, if they're facing any kind of harassment by the landlord, all this is happening by the way. Uh, if they want to apply for funding, like federal funds, where often it's very complicated, these applications, you really do sometimes need an attorney to help you. So this program, which is run out of the Department of Small Business Assistance, uh, Small Business Services, would be strengthened and expanded by our new bill, which uh, actually just passed last week. That's really great. Um, I want to sort of pivot back to the opening of the schools in person. Yes. learning. And um, I, I, as I understand it, not every school is doing, is having in person. Why are some schools allowed to say, listen, everybody can stay home and some schools are not? Well, most public schools in New York City are going to have 
a blended option on the table for students, which would allow them to come in for in-person instruction on generally two days a week, sometimes uh, one, two, or three days a week. But there are some schools which have really difficult space constraints and have opted to go all online. Very few though. What, what we are seeing some more, in fact, even at my son's school, uh, we're seeing that the older grades are being run exclusively by distance learning and uh, the in-person resources are being prioritized for younger grades. Mm -hmm. and, and the logic there is that younger kids, they really need and benefit more from the social and emotional benefits of in-person learning and that older kids are, are able to adapt easier to distance learning. Um, and that's why uh, we opened pre-K first. Uh, that actually happened last week. And uh, older grades, kindergarten and up, are being done uh, this coming week. So there's a logic to that. But it does seem like about 50% of families are opting to go distance learning only and then about 50% are op opting for the blended in-person option. Um, and I do think that the relatively low number of people choosing in-person reflects just, I think, confusion and frustration with what's happening in person. And I have to say, frankly, it's been extremely disappointing that we, we have had to delay the opening multiple times because uh, the city schools weren't ready, frankly. They weren't ready with staffing and other logistical uh, needs in place. And, um, you know, that has been, uh, I think, really traumatic for New York City families who have been depending on the schedule, who have now, are now on their third reopening date, scheduled for this coming week. Let's, let's hope it that doesn't have to change again. But uh, honestly, I couldn't rule that out. Um, particularly the, the staffing shortage, which was entirely foreseeable and in fact has been highlighted repeatedly. Uh, the principals union and teachers union have sounded the alarm on that because if you're gonna have a cohort in the classroom and the other half of the kids are online, you need two teachers essentially. Um, so you're going to need to hire thousands of new teachers to cover both sides of that. And we knew that, we could have known that back in May when the outlines of this were taking shape and the failure to prepare for that uh, is probably the biggest reason why we have to keep delaying the opening. And it's really, it's really inexcusable and kids are paying the price. Teachers are paying the price. Principals are also dealing with extremely difficult circumstances. And you know, that's even not primarily about the threat of the virus. It's essentially management problems that should have been handled better. And uh, it's just deeply disappointing. Yeah, there is something that I read about that I want to ask you about that is good, I guess. It's the expanding um, the rapid COVID testing yes. sites. Tell me about that. I mean, testing has just been a mess throughout this entire pandemic, mainly because of failures by the federal government. They just, they haven't mobilized production. Uh, they really don't have a national testing plan even at this late date. And we've paid the price in New York. Um, we have been able to battle our way to expanding capacity. We're now at about 30,000 tests a day. That number is actually still going up. Just to give you some perspective, back in March, it was a couple hundred tests a day. So we've certainly made a lot of progress. Um, but the question is not just how many tests are done. The question is, how long does it take to get results? Right. And if you're not getting the result back for five, seven, or even longer, five or seven days or longer, it defeats the purpose of the test. Right, I, I took a test, I think we spoke about it, and it took 14 days for it to come back. I mean, that, that's, that's horrible, and it, it's pointless. In fact, it actually does damage, because by the time you get the result, you might think that a negative means you're safe, but you could have caught it in the meantime. So we really need results, ideally in 24 hours, but certainly 48 hours or less to be useful. Um, at this point, uh, I, I, the, the last statistic, statistic I heard is that 75% of the tests in New York City are coming back in three days or less. So that's progress. There's still some that are longer than three. That's not acceptable. Uh, particularly in the context of schools, though, we just, mm -hmm. we got to get results back in 24 to 48 because then you could have a child or a teacher, teacher who's back in the classroom every day 
and more people could catch the virus. We can't have that. Right. The city has made a guarantee of 48 hours or less. In the early days, uh, there were maybe 5 to 10% of the tests were not coming back that quick. So that's, that's not acceptable. That's got to be fixed. But there is some good news for the general public. There are more options available for quick tests. The Department of Health now has sites um, there are four in Manhattan, which can get you tests back usually in a few hours, max by the next day. Uh, there's one in Chelsea uh, on Ninth Avenue, 303 Ninth Avenue. There's one uh, on kind of Upper West Side, Morningside Heights on 100th Street between Columbus and Amsterdam. Also one in Central Harlem, one in Washington Heights, where um, you do have to make an appointment. But again, the results are, are super quick, a matter of hours. And the city's uh, health and hospitals clinics have also gotten much faster. And most of them are getting results back in less than 48 hours. So this is places like Harlem Hospital, Metropolitan Hospital, Gouverneur, Sydenham, and some of the other uh, H&H clinics. The situation is getting better. City MD has been a, a real problem on turnaround time. And it's very popular in Manhattan because there are a lot of them and people see them and you know, there are very visible storefronts. But until now, City and B has probably had some of the slowest turnaround times because of the specific lab they're using. It's getting better, but I would say still uh, slower than it should be. So that's a landscape of the options. Um, people really do need to be careful about where they go get, get a test so that um, they're not waiting and waiting and waiting for results. Yeah, we'll have a blog on uh, MNN.org with all the sites listed that you just oh, talked about. Yeah, and um, I want to really thank you today for coming. This is such important information for people to, to know as we head into the fall, um, and I really appreciate your time. It is a pleasure being on MNN, and uh, I thank you for continuing to highlight the challenges of this pandemic, and I hope all your viewers stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you very much. If you live here in New York City, you might have on occasion wanted to record a interaction with a police officer, or you might have wondered what your rights are if a police officer ever stopped you and asked to search you. Well, there are organizations that can give you the truth and factual information about what to do in any situation involving your interaction with an NYPD officer. Joining me now is Casey Foster with the nonprofit Community United for Police Reform, and they are an organization and a coalition of many organizations that will give you answers to questions just like that. Thank you for joining us, Casey. So talk to us a little bit just about the mission of your organization. Absolutely. So Communities United for Police Reform is a coalition of community organizations across New York City, um, really representing um, communities and New Yorkers that are most impacted by police abuse and misconduct. Um, so I'm with the organization uh, Make the Road New York, uh, who we are one of the founding members of Communities United for Police Reform. We work with uh, communities of color um, in Bushwick, Brooklyn, in Staten Island, in uh, Jackson Heights, Queens. Um, and a lot of the young people in our organization are really vulnerable and have been um, over the years vulnerable to police abuse and misconduct um, and have come uh, together within our organization uh, to really organize um, against police abuse and misconduct and harassment in their communities. Um, but we're just one of the many organizations in Communities United for Police Reform. Uh, you have organizations um, such as Fierce that work with um, membership of young queer people throughout the Bronx and other neighborhoods in the, uh, in the city, organizations such as the Justice Committee, um, which work with family members um, that have been killed by New Yorkers, um, such as the family of Eric Garner, the family of Romali Graham, family of Anthony Baez. Uh, and the coalition also has uh, legal advocates and organizations such as New York Civil Liberty Union, um, Legal Aid, and, and Bronx Defenders. We bring all of these stakeholders together um, really to address the ongoing um, kind of oppression and repression from policing communities of color uh, in New York City um, through very intentional tactics, broken windows policing and other discriminatory um, policing practices. And you know, we are really pushing uh, not only in a way to reduce those practices, but really to reduce the power and reach 
of the police department and to the lives of, of, of our communities. So there are 50 organizations, nonprofits under this coalition? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And they're in every borough, including Manhattan? Every borough, including Manhattan. And so can some, does someone come, if let's say they don't know of an organization that would be under your umbrella, do, can they come to, to you? Can they come to Community United for Police Reform and say, I want to join, I need help? On our website, um, we list the names of organizations uh, that are in the coalition. Um, and you know, it depends. I work a lot with young people that make the road. And so I'm thinking about young people in Manhattan and in Harlem. There's a great organization that's a part of Communities United for Police Reform in West Harlem, um, which is the Brotherhood Sister Soul, um, who work with young people throughout West Harlem and, and the rest of Harlem. And so, you know, if you were a young person in Manhattan or Harlem and you were looking to join up with an organization that's involved in this movement, uh, you know, you could definitely reach out to a Brotherhood Sister Soul. Other organizations may not necessarily be in Harlem. For example, Fierce, which is located uh, in the Bronx, um, you can live in Manhattan and, and be a member of Fierce if you're a young uh, queer person looking for a safe place where you can also learn to organize um, for power in your community. Uh, you know, you could join up with an organization like that. And so geography um, is not the limitation to join the organizations in the coalition. That's great. There are definitely some organizations uh, locally in Manhattan. What kind of things um, are you teaching? You're saying that you're educating people on how to do things. Tell me some of those things that are, that are being taught. The coalition, you know, actively and consistently is providing Know Your Rights workshops for member organizations and, and communities. Um, and so, you know, I, one of the recent victories we had was we passed the Right to Know Act. And the Right to Know Act is a law in New York City in which if a police officer stops you, depending on the stop, um, they are supposed to identify who they are, right? They're supposed to give you a business card that identifies who they are. A lot of times we would have people in the community stopped by officers um, and that interaction could go a lot of different ways. And then you never end up knowing if you didn't catch their badge, their, you know, who they are, you don't know whose interaction you just had, right? And so if you go to file a complaint with whatever system of complaint we have, you may not even know who you're filing a complaint against. Right, so the Right to Know Act um, now requires officers to identify themselves by giving New Yorkers uh, a business card. It also requires uh, officers um, to clearly let people know um, that if they're being stopped, that there's a constitutional right um, to search them. Meaning the officer can ask to search you, but you have to give them permission to be searched, right? Like a lot of people don't know in some instances that an officer, um, they can't just search you because they've stopped you on the street and they're asking you some questions. So in these cases, when laws like that are, are passed or new policies are passed, uh, you know, we are actively providing Know Your Rights workshops so people understand their rights and interactions with police. Um, many organizations within Communities United for Police Reform are also actively cop watching, um, which means they are in communities monitoring um, the police um, protecting people by monitoring police during interactions. And we have organizations within Communities United for Police Reform um, that absolutely provide training in, in how to um, kind of safely uh, cop watch. And, and it could be that you're just in your community and you see an interaction and you, you bring out your cell phone and, and you want to um, record what's happening. You know, the training will help you understand kind of how to record that in a way in which um, stay safe you can stay safe, exactly. So um, I, you've mentioned transparency, and this summer, uh, Governor Cuomo signed um, the repeal of 50A into law, and recently, and you know, not surprisingly, um, police unions have been fighting that. And last week, I believe, there was a stay of that law, which um, despite um, you know, certain drips and drabs of um, disciplinary records being released, it really put a, a plug in the jug, as it were. Um, talk to me a little bit about that and where your organization is on that issue and what's been going on. Yeah, it's, it's not surprising that the unions filed um, after 50A passed. Um, they continue to act as if the police department is its own branch of government and that they can act with impunity um, in our communities. Um, and so, you know, the, the stay is temporary. It just means that there likely will be a case that will be heard 
it's not surprising. And in some ways, when we actually think about like, what are we like, what is being fought and what, what we're slowing down right now, it's, it's amazing that, that this is slowing down, that, that we don't already have access to the records, disciplinary records of people who work for a public agency. Right. right, like police officers are a, that is a public that is supposed to be a public agency, and New York has not until repealing 50A, when it originally passed sometime in the 70s, that we've gone X number of years with the law that says the public don't have the right to know the disciplinary record of people who are walking our communities with guns and the state sanctioned ability to use those weapons and force against people in our community, and so. The fact that we're even fighting for this now um, to be public, um, I think says a lot about where we still are in America in terms of the power that police have. Um, as an agency that's you know, supposed to be protecting our communities um, as opposed to, uh, you know, again, acting as if they have impunity and that they don't have to answer to anyone uh, let alone the people in the communities that they're supposed to be protecting. After reading the, just the information on your website about this, uh, it seems that your organization is pretty secure in the thought that this will not be permanent, this stay. We feel confident that the courts are going to do the right thing here and that they're going to release the records of employees of a public agency um, and that just like the records of a doctor who works for a public hospital or a teacher who works at a public school, that there's no question that these records should be public and they should have never been hidden from the public view to begin with. And so we trust that the courts will do the right thing um, and that it's just a matter of time until, um, you know, the law that was passed is able to f go, you know, be fully enacted. So tell people how they can reach you and how they can join or get involved? Um, just one last thing. Yeah, absolutely. So you can go to Communities United for Police Reform, uh, search uh, the website. Uh, you will see the member organizations um, that are involved in uh, Communities United for Police Reform. Um, you can search out any of those organizations that they're in your community. Um, and again, there's, you know, there's different levels of uh, membership within the coalition for organizations. Um, and so we really do span um, the, the reach of communities, every corner in New York City that's impacted by discriminatory policing. Uh, you know, we have organizations that are representing people in those communities. And so I encourage people um, to visit us online, um, to look up the members. There's a section on the website that shares the members that are involved in the coalition and reach out um, to those organizations um, that are involved in the coalition and doing work uh, in your neighborhoods and communities. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Casey. It was great to talk to you. Thank you.